Good day and welcome to the channel. In this video, we're going to explain how to buy a computer. Specifically, we're going to go over 10 items from form factor, to CPU, type of drive, things like that. And because I'm a tech and I've been doing this literally since the 80s, I can tell you that you can get really weedy with this. And I find it quite frustrating when people get really deep into the weeds on, on some of these uh, things, because in the end, they really don't make that much difference. Some of the little weedy things. I'm Intel certified. I'm Microsoft certified, I'm Kingston authorized, I used to be Dell authorized, blah, blah, blah. The point is, I understand what all of this tech means, and I'm going to explain it to you without getting insanely weedy. Okay, so let's get to it. The very first thing you need to figure out is what's the form factor. And yeah, that's techno garbage for what do you want? Laptop, PC, whatever. In my case, I want none of the above. I want what's called an all-in-one. If you don't know what an all-in-one is, let me show you. But everything we're going to speak of from here out will apply to all computers. So don't just think it just applies to this. Now, I've already decided I'm going to buy a Dell, so I'm going to go to the Dell website. But again, what we're gonna show you applies to HP and to Asus, whatever else you want. So let's go off to Dell, desktops, all-in-ones in my case is what I'm looking for. So I think everybody knows what a laptop is. We're not gonna explain that. The desktop, there's different sizes of cases. There's you know things like that are SFF, that's small form factor, big towers, so on and so forth. What a lot of people aren't aware of is the all-in-ones. So let's very briefly go over that. All an all-in-one is, is a laptop with a giant screen and a separate keyboard. So basically everything's built into the back of the screen. Now, the second thing that you need to decide on is what type of screen you want, what size, resolution. So let's explain those. In my case, I know I want the 27 inch. And by the way, before I went through this, uh, I've already looked at the 24 inch and the, the price difference of the 27 inch isn't that much. So, and given the amount of hours I spend on it, I'm going to spend my money on the 27. It's a few hundred dollars more, but for me, much better. The size of screen really makes a difference, but also the resolution of the screen. You might think that all 27 inch screens are a certain resolution. Like I have a 27 inch screen that's to the right of me that you can't see right now. And that screen is 4k, which means it's about 4,000 pixels or dots across the top of the screen by about 2,000 pixels up and down. And basically all that means is the more dots, the more pixels, the sharper the picture is. But I really don't need 4K. I'm happy with the traditional 1080p, normal high def. It's about 2,000 dots across the top by about 1,000 dots down. Now, if you're buying a laptop, something to consider is you'll often see these screens and, you know, these 15 inch screens, and they might have a really low resolution, like 1366 or something by 768. I can't work with that because some things won't even fit on the screen. 768 dots tall is not enough dots. So for me, and I think virtually everybody, you really got to get to 1080. And the next thing to know with the screen is what type of screen. I will only work with a touch screen. Some people don't care. If you're old enough, you'll know what working with a mouse was, uh, what working without a mouse used to be like. And you'll know that, you know, you can work just fine without a mouse. But once you get it, wow, it's just better. And the touchscreen's the same sort of thing, other than I don't use the touchscreen very much. I just use it you know, a few times a day. But man, it's nice just to go, it's right there and just touch it. And again, it's an extra hundred dollars or something, but I'm gonna keep this machine for three to five years. I don't care about the extra hundred bucks. That's me, you might really care, and fair enough. That's the second thing. The third thing, and this only applies to laptops, is weight. If your laptop is 15.6 inch screen, which is a traditional sort of normal laptop, it's probably a little bulky. I really like the 14 inch screens for executives and for, well, even my kids, I just really like those. Um, but there are some 15.6 inch screens that are just great, they're nice, thin and light. And yeah, so just take a look at the weight and the physical size and say, and eh, no, I don't carry that around. Okay, fourth thing, and by the way, yes, this is the order you should probably be filtering down. The fourth thing is the CPU. So like everybody, I started out as an Intel guy and then I went off to Cyrix and AMD. Uh, they were great in the uh, two, early 2000s and then Intel got it back and they were just so much better. And then AMD started kicking Intel's butt up and down the field. So now you've got a choice to make, a Intel or AMD. In the price ranges I'm looking at, the Intels are the better product. I don't really care what the brand is. I like both companies. What I care about is the price performance ratio. For me, the Intel's provide better value. So in my case, what we're gonna get down to here is the generation of Intel chip and then the version of Intel chip. Let's go over the generations here. I'm only going to buy a 12th gen chip. 
Let me explain exactly what that means. The 12th gen came out at the start of 2022 and there are some distinct advantages. So with the 12th generation Intel Core CPUs, what they've done is something pretty creative. Well, it was creative all right, just not really by Intel. They're just copying what a very large chip company called ARM does. Now, again, we're not, I don't wanna to get too weedy here, but it boils down to your cell phone and a bunch of laptop tablets are using ARM chips, uh, ARM. And what ARM did was they came out with what they call their big little process. So their chips have a couple of really strong cores that, that are able to really handle the major workloads. And they put a whole bunch of really cheap, low power cores on the same CPU. Well, Intel has copied that. And what they've done now is uh, their chips, uh, the 12th generation, which is why I'm going to 12th generation, have what Intel calls P cores and E cores. P cores are the performance cores. They're the cores you're used to. That's the CPU that's running everything in the foreground, doing all the really heavy lifting. What's really new are the E cores, which are low powered, smaller, much cheaper, and they just sit on that same package that Intel sells as a single uh, CPU. And you might ask, well, how powerful are these E cores if they're so cheap and small? And they're pretty good. An E core, according to Intel, offers 40% more performance than a sixth generation full core, which they called Skylake. And if you think, well, if they're so powerful, why don't they use them in other things and just use just the E-cores? Well, they do. Those E-cores that you get in this in the Intel core package here, the i5s, i7s, and i3s, those E-cores are going to be used as standalone chips in things that they brand as Celeron and Pentium. So if you see those names. Okay, that's pretty weedy. So for me, the 12th generation is where I want to go. And now the question is, well, do you go with i3, i5, or i7? Now, I know I don't want to go with the i3 because it doesn't meet my technical requirements when I check it when I check benchmarks, which is where I'm going here. But the i5 versus the i7, you can see here that the price difference, this is $1,100 for this machine, and a very similar looking machine is $1,400. And the primary difference is the chip. Generally speaking, i3 is the bottom of the normal barrel until you get into Celerons and stuff, which we'll just ignore. And then i5 is mid-range and i5 is the higher end. And they also have i9s now, but again, we'll leave that alone because they're very, very expensive. So we'll settle on the difference between the i5 and the i7. And really the only way to tell the difference, well, the difference you care about is to check benchmark. And you just type in versus, paste the chip name in, and you'll end up with a whole lot of different uh, websites that literally put them side by side. Let's look at this one. By the way, no, this is not paid. Nobody's given me anything. Look, you can read through this, but I already have, and it boils down to the i7 is 10, 15% faster. So you can see here in single core performance, it's about 10% better. Power efficiency, it's the same, but in full performance with all of the cores, it's a pretty good jump, close to 20%. All benchmarks are not created equal. So if you're looking at a benchmark, Find the one you care about most. If you're doing a lot of video editing, well, that's different from gaming. And if you're not gaming or doing video editing, maybe you're writing code or just working in an office. You're just doing standard stuff, surfing, watching videos, blah, 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 but you're not doing anything heavy. In my case, I do a lot of video editing. And so you can see here, that's a pretty big bump up, right? Going to the i7, 23% better in Cinebench. Multi-core, 45%. That's a big jump. So for me, the i7 looks like it might be worth an extra few dollars. And that gets to a good point of, well, is it worth a couple hundred dollars? If I can extend the life of this computer by one year, yeah, it's definitely worth a few hundred dollars up front. So the i7 for me is probably the win here. So let's scroll down here to the specs. And on the off chance you care, you'll be able to see why it's faster. One, the i7 just runs faster. Now let's go take a look at another site. If you're ever really interested to learn what's in that CPU, go to arc.intel.com. That is Intel's non-marketing website. They just give you facts. So I'm going to click into the core processors, 12th generation i7. There, that's the one I was looking at. And you can see here, this chip has two full cores and eight efficient cores. <laughs> and you might think, well, eight plus two equals 10. How do you get 12 threads? A thread, by the way, is just a single process. The reason why total number of threads is 12 is because performance cores can actually run two threads at the same time. Okay, that's kind of weedy, I know. Let's get out of this.
and back to the site, there was a little comment that you might not have caught. You know, I know what I'm doing and I didn't catch this. There's a little line here, the integrated GPU. So you look at the GPU as the graphic processing unit. Basically integrated video, the video that's built onto uh, an Intel chip used to be garbage, but now it's really freaking good. It's very low power, which is great for laptops and things. And if you look at this, it doesn't look all that different. Alder like you, blah, 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 blah. It's the same, it's targeted laptop. Okay, okay. So what's the big difference? Right here. It's an Iris XE 96 versus 80 EUs. What's an EU? Well, an Intel EU is an execution unit. Again, we're going to avoid the weeds here. This is a lot better. Let's check a quick benchmark. So here you can see that those extra EUs, execution units, really made a difference. It says here about 53%. Yeah, it's a big deal. Now, let's go back and try to come out of the weeds a little bit. One of the other options we could do is we could spend a few hundred dollars more and we could get a little bit more memory and we could get a dedicated video card. That's the big difference in this one. Well, don't be fooled by that. Dedicated video cards aren't always better. So let's click on this and see what we get. So you can see here that the Iris XE, the Intel integrated video, which costs virtually nothing, it's built in, actually runs more games than the GeForce MX. And the benchmark is so close, right? So 279 versus 285. And I found this video yesterday quite interesting. So let's just click on it. So you can see in this game, uh, the Iris XE is, uh, FPS is frames per second. And you can see here, that it's not running near as fast as the MX. Okay, different game. They're running the same and they sure look the same. Okay, the MX is better, but the Iris XE, the Intel one, is really good. So, yep, technically better, but uh, I don't see it. These two are the same again. So, is the MX550 worth a few hundred dollars? I don't think so, especially because I'm not gaming that much with it and I don't like wasting electricity. I also don't like the complexity it adds. It's another set of drivers, it's another thing to go wrong. Okay, next, hard drive storage. This used to be a big deal. We're gonna skip through it because it really isn't much anymore. What you're looking for, just make sure it has M.2. If it's an M.2, that means it's a solid state drive and it is plugging in in a very efficient way. As soon as you see that, you're good to go. And then you can compare the size, 512 versus one terabyte, blah, blah, blah. If you see anything that says RPM, that means it's a spinning disk, that's revolutions per minute, that's old, and it might be good for things like pictures and things, things you're not going to use very often. Uh, and in this case, I've got an innovation where they're using both a solid state drive and SSD. Uh, and if you have a question, get a hold of whoever, Dell, HP, whoever you're working with. Just ask. Next thing to look for is RAM. You really need four gig as a minimum. And uh, yes, I, I can hear everybody yawning at this point saying, Four gigs garbage, blah, 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 but yeah, I'm talking about to be practical, okay? Eight gig is where a lot of things are, and I'm partial to 16 gig, but uh, I, you know, when you check your memory usage, you'll often find it's not using anywhere near that much. So this is a 12 gig. This is probably what I'm going to use. This is not the ideal arrangement. You typically want to see two identical sticks of memory. This is one eight and one four, but okay, I'll live with it. Do not pay an extra penny for the faster speed. That's 3,200 megahertz. If you see something that's 3,300 or 3,500 or whatever, you are not going to notice it. You'll barely notice it in a benchmark. Okay, number eight, the bits. And you, you bits being things like camera, keyboard, mouse. And you think, why do I really care about those? Well, some keyboards and mice are really annoying. Some people like wireless, some people don't. I, for instance, will pretty much only use a wired keyboard because as a tech, I work all day and I know that my freaking wireless keyboard is going to let me down right when I need it. So when I've got a client or I'm in a meeting or whatever, it's got on something a little more interesting, which is the camera. And you think, why would I really care about the camera? They're all pretty good these days. Yeah, it's not the quality of the camera you should look at. They are all pretty good. What you should look at is whether it has support for Windows Hello or biometric login. So on the computer that I'm recording this on, I never sign in. I just sit down, the machine recognizes me and it bloop, signs me in. And because I'm a tech and I work on this stuff all day, it really is good. I hate putting passwords in, even pins. In this case, however, I've got a hold of Dell and I've confirmed none of these uh, units have a biometric camera. They just have a regular camera, which is disappointing. Why am I still going to buy this? 
Dell explained that they've only got the biometric cameras now on their high-end laptops, the, mostly the corporate stuff. That got me to thinking that it probably has to do with the chip shortage. And I checked a bunch of other vendors, Asus, HP, and found that most of them don't have it either. So I think it just has to do with the chip shortage. Also, because it's a camera, I can add it on easy. And I found a cheap biometric camera on Amazon for 35, I think it was $35. Number nine, the warranty and the return policy. Where you're getting it makes a difference. I like to get a lot of the stuff at Costco because Costco doubles the warranty and that's a big deal. Also, I can just bring it back after a few weeks of using it. But in this case, I'm gonna buy it directly from Dell because I can't find this unit anywhere else. Number 10 in our big list of things to look for when you're buying a computer. Miscellaneous, just things like, do you like the look of it, right? I mean, if it's white and you want black or black and you want white, well, that's kind of a showstopper. Do you have a promo code? As I said, Dell is not paying me for this in any way, but I do have a Dell promo code. How did I get a Dell promo code? Well, if you work for pretty much any company, you can go to Dell, well, in my case, Dell.ca, because uh, I'm in Canada, but in your case, you go to Dell dot com probably if you're American and type in slash MPP member partnership program and they'll send you a coupon and that will be 5% discount for pretty much anybody that's a student or working for a company that has anything to do with Dell. Well, don't I need to go through human resources or the IT guy? No, 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 just put your name in. I'll send you a code and you get about 5%. If you don't get a code for some reason, there's an easy way to fix that too. Go back to Dell, go to contact us and chat and I guarantee you, they'll give you at least 5% off. Well, I shouldn't guarantee anything. I have always seen them give you at least 5% off. And I'm talking off the sale price. The miscellaneous stuff, here's a nice little add-on that they've kicked in. They're putting in Disney Plus for six months. That's great. And something to just think about is brand. Nobody builds garbage computers anymore. When I was building machines in the late 2000s, I really, really had to watch what I was doing. There were components were just problematic. You could get some really bad stuff. Nowadays, it's all really good. It's kind of like cars. You know, people think, oh, Hyundai's garbage or General Motors is garbage or BMW's garbage, you know, so much service. Well, yeah, they're all really good now. So yes, there are better and worse. Fair enough. But if you've never used an HP before, give HP a try. If you find the product that meets your requirements at a reasonable price. Now, I can tell you from my experience, everybody loves Asus where I, where I am, right? My friends, my colleagues, coworkers, they all love Asus. I have nothing but troubles with Asus, so I stay away from them. But that just seems to be the way it works for me. Also, HP just doesn't seem to have the build quality of these Dell. I used to really rail against Dell. They just produced a terrible product in the early 2000s, but it's not the same company. Michael Dell has taken the company private, cleaned it all up. They produce a damn good product. If you look through our channel, you'll see there's lots of Dell tear, you know, teardowns, upgrades, and things like that. So I'm not telling you what to buy. I'm simply saying a company you didn't like in the early 2000s, is not the same company today. Hey, we'd love to hear what you think. So please put a comment down in the, in the bottom about something we glossed over or something that we uh, didn't, uh, didn't cover at all, for instance, like Wi-Fi 6. And tell us what your favorite brand is. And please click like, it's such a big deal for the Google algorithms, I'd really appreciate it. Subscribe also, super appreciated. And you can always get a hold of us at www.urteck.ca. That's urtech.ca. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye.